Yes. Hi everyone, welcome to Sunya IS. I hope I'm live and it's working fine from your side. So in today's session, guys, we'll discuss the complete expansion of Britishers in India. This lecture is extremely important for you because here you'll cover the entire scenario of Anglo wars like the Anglo-Maratha war, Anglo-Sikh war, Anglo-Afghan war. And we'll also cover the neighboring countries like Burma, Bhutan, Nepal and so many other things, right? So let's see how it started with the Anglo-Maratha war. After Anglo-Maratha war, we will cover the next part in which the Anglo-Sikh, Anglo-Afghan, Sindh and other territories will be there, right? So Anglo-Maratha means we are talking about this particular part, okay? This is the Maratha state and here I want you to see something. Look at this map. This is your Hyderabad, which was the Nizam's dominion. And this is the Maratha state, okay, Maratha state. So in this map, you can see that the boundary of Marathas, uh, it used to be fluctuating, okay. They were increasing the boundary. And we'll see that they had so many disputes also. So we'll understand that how the problem came. Uh, it was a family dispute, but it became a, a you know national dispute and it led to English penetrate into the Maratha family. So we will just cover it, right? I hope it's working fine, guys. Please like the video if you can watch me and tell me in the comment section. Yes? Great. Now let's start and I'll just again resume the session from this flowchart because we covered it in the last class but I'll just you know again uh, make it clear for you and let's revise this chart again because this is the chart of Peshwa family let me repeat it for you as we discussed in the last class that Shahu was released by Bahadur Shah Shahu was released from the prison of Bahadur Shah, the later Mughal ruler, okay, in 1707, when Bahadur Shah became the new ruler, the new Mughal ruler, he decided to release Shahu and followed a pacifist policy. Shahu wanted to get the throne back and to conquer the throne, he had a lot of family disputes and there he was helped by his accountant, Balaji Vishwanath and due to this help only Balaji Vishwanath was made Peshwa. So after Shahu became the emperor, he decided that he will start a new post of Peshwa ship. Peshwa means prime minister and he will be having all the important executive and military powers. Now Balaji Vishwanath got this right and it was a hereditary position. After Balaji Vishwanath, Baji Rao I became the next Peshwa who was also known as Firing Peshwa and he started a policy of Hindu Patpat Shahi. Accordingly, we can say that the Akhand Bharat, the dream of Akhand, Akhand Bharat was given by Baji Rao I in which he wanted to include, include uh, the neighboring territories uh, uh, and other parts of the countries in the Indian map and you know considered it to be a Hindu state and then we see that uh, here we had one more uh, lineage coming from Balaji Vishwanath by Chimmaji Appa and he had a son uh, Sadashiv Rao Bhau but Sadashiv Rao died in the third battle of Panipat in 1761 the 1761 third battle of Panipat is very important where Ahmad Shah Abdali, the emperor of Durrani kingdom, defeated the Marathas and the dream of Maratha to rule the entire India was now culminated. So here you will see that it will go in a very downgrade form and they won't be able to conquer other lands and the you know expansion was somehow stopped for a while. But it was not the end of Marathas because after 1761 we see that other Peshwas again tried to consolidate the power. So after Baji Rao won, we see that Balaji Baji Rao became the next Peshwa. So here you can see the date 1740 to 61 and in 1761 only the death of Sadashiv Rao Bhau happened. Sadashiv Rao was not very mature. He was a very young, uh, you know, a young boy and at a very early age he died. Okay, but he was always assisted and helped by Balaji Baji Rao. But Balaji Baji Rao after uh, the battle of Panipat died and after him, uh, Madhav Rao one became the next Peshwa. 
when madhav rao won became the next peshwa at that time his uncle raghunath rao was waiting because he was the brother of balaji baji rao but he was waiting to get the throne of peshwa to get the peshwa ship but he was not allowed because it was a hereditary position and as we see that balaji baji rao was more competent and after him madhav rao was very very competent but madhav rao died due to tb and from 1761 to 1772 he was able to rule for 10 years he led the peshwa ship and he followed a very good policy to consolidate the power and regain some you know territories again back to the marathas so he was a very good peshwa after his death his brother became narayan rao became the next peshwa but when narayan rao became the peshwa this time raghunath rao became very impatient and he planned a murder of narayan rao okay he wanted narayan rao to be assassinated to kill narayan rao he planned everything and when he killed narayan rao when he got narayan rao assassinated after his murder only we see that during this particular planning of murder when narayan rao died wife of narayan rao ganga bai she was pregnant and she gave birth to a son named as savai madhav rao narayan or savai madhav rao okay or we can just call him savai so this infant baby would be declared as the new peshwa which will upset the ragunath rao so ragunath rao when he was replaced by savai madhav narayan rao became very unhappy and signed a treaty with english east india company in bombay but if you can understand the eic at that time gave more powers to calcutta council and the bengal's governor was more important and had more powers than bombay and madras so as you understand that eic started a process of centralization in india and that's why calcutta council rejected the treaty signed by bombay eic and raghunath rao according to which raghunath rao uh, you know was given few soldiers to fight against the family members against uh, savai madhav rao and also raghunath rao was assisted by eic in the war he gave the areas of basin and also shared few taxes but uh, this treaty was cancelled by the calcutta council because they sent new colonel colonel upton and then the new treaty the treaty of urantar was signed so i'll just tell you this entire scenario of treaty of surat and purandhar is known as the first anglo maratha war where we will see that due to this uh, you know a mistake of raghunath rao taking help uh, from eic led eic with the mixing of this maratha uh, you know complexity and then started the first anglo maratha war however in the first anglo maratha war uh, britishers were not able to defeat uh, marathas because marathas had a very good guerrilla warfare skill and they were able to defeat them but none of the party accept the defeat uh, britishers consider that they got the victory and they were able to uh, you know overpower and suppress marathas but marathas they considered that no uh, they were able to defeat britishers so here we can see that uh, none of them got the victory and they both just had a fight a clash but it was not profitable for anyone but again when they came to peace uh, you will see after the death of raghunath rao baji rao to became next peshwa baji rao to is the son of raghunath rao here you see that savai madhav rao who was an infant uh, when he became peshwa he was an infant and he was led by bara bhai bara bhai are 12 chiefs 12 maratha chiefs known as bara bhai and they were led by nana fadnavis okay so nana fadnavis was the leader who was maintaining everything in the maratha confederacy but here you will see that uh, savai madhav narayan rao uh, died because he committed suicide and he was not able to handle this family pressure as he committed suicide to then hereditarily the right goes to the baji rao second he was again very much similar like his father the way his father signed the treaty with eic he also signed the treaty with eic led to the second anglo maratha war okay then we will see the third anglo maratha war in which uh, uh, later on you'll see that baji rao too will realize his mistake and will try to conquer the powers again 
and will take help from his family members but by that time it was too late and that's why the third anglo maratha war where marathas lost completely and peshwa ship was abolished okay so this is the story which we need to understand today here you need to just understand this chart that uh, number 1 we had balaji vishwanath as peshwa after him baji rao one became after him baji uh, balaji baji rao uh became the third peshwa after him madhav rao became the fourth peshwa after madhav rao fifth is narayan rao after narayan rao we will see that savai the infant baby is a disputed peshwa with raghunath rao okay so raghunath rao and savai they they both will come on number 6 okay he is also number 6 and then 7 baji rao second okay so seven peshwas you need to remember fine if you want you can just see and take a screenshot of this chart okay right right nana sahib nana fadnavis same yes abhishek uh abhishek you you are saying that uh, you missed previously lecture see guys in case you have missed the classes don't worry it is always recorded and you can watch it by just searching the playlist of sunya is on this particular youtube platform you would be able to get the three lectures but understand that you must come live because it's good to interact live we would be able to talk and i really feel very good when you guys come live so that i see you guys are here and it gives me a feeling of the offline class right so recently we have covered the offline batch in the sunya is where we discussed the entire modern indian history we covered some pyqs also but i was just missing that vibe of offline class that's why i decided not to record these videos and come live on daily basis so that we interact and you also revise something and talk to me right so that's why i just want you to be live on time okay and you need to like and share this video please like it because it really gives us a lot of energy you don't know that with one like you give me a immense power and energy which will come as a you know new skill with me and it would be reflected in the classes okay so you can only improve the quality and the presence of this lecture series by liking and sharing the video and you would be able to bring new courses on the platform by supporting this idea okay so that's why you need to support the team now let's come to the uh, story which is in a bookish language now i just told you the entire thing in this flow chart manner and that flow chart was just to make things clear for you and easy for you but in the bookish language we will cover it again uh, we will just revise it again we will repeat each and every point the way it is written in your spectrum so that when you read the book you don't get confused okay so let's start the journey of anglo maratha struggle this is anglo maratha struggle for supremacy okay they are fighting for what they are fighting for supremacy means there is no reason to fight okay they had no reason to fight english and marathas but they are just clashing for supremacy to get superiority here you understand that marathas were neighbors of mysore okay that's why in maratha uh, you know problem you will see that britishers will initially follow a peace policy in the first anglo maratha war we will see that ultimately english east india company will sign a very peaceful treaty and they will also try to you know settle raghunath rao why because they never wanted to have a uh, simultaneous wars with marathas and mysore together on the same time right so they had this strategy that one by one we will defeat these indian rulers first we will just focus on mysore and to defeat mysore they needed help from marathas because if you remember in the first and second anglo mysore war east india company was not able to defeat hyder ali and tipu sultan but in the third and fourth anglo mysore war they got help from marathas and nizam of hyderabad that's why britishers were able to defeat mysore so to defeat mysore they took help from marathas as they wanted the backing 
from marathas every time they could not take this risk to have a simultaneous war on marathas and mysore together and that's why in the first and second anglo maratha war you will see that britishers are following a very peace policy okay they they knew about their weak position so they were playing very smartly and that's why in the first anglo maratha war they settled things with raghunath rao so let's understand what is the story first of all understand the maratha dominion and the maratha state See, it was a very big power okay they used to collect uh, taxes like sir deshmukhi and chauth they were allowed to perform a lot of duties and functions in behalf of moguls also because by that time moguls had lost all their powers and later moguls were not doing good so now marathas they had this big arrangement uh, and they made this confederacy where they divided the maratha state into few parts okay so under the arrangement of maratha confederacy each prominent family means powerful family powerful family means what marathas used to work under deccan sultanate if you remember i told you the story of medieval india in the medieval india during the medieval india we had a bahamani kingdom here and bahamani kingdom was disintegrated into five sultans deccan sultanate so bahamani kingdom became deccan sultanate the grand alliance in the deccan sultanate we had bijapur berar bidar golconda right so these uh, you know deccan rulers they had a confederacy and during the medieval times they used to be together and it was penetrated by the moguls initially by akbar and then shah jahan later aurangzeb became uh, aurangzeb became the governor of deccan india he destructed the deccan empire because he hated shia muslims and when deccan state was destructed marathas came out of it so marathas used to work under the deccan state under the deccan kingdom with deccan sultan and they used to serve as you know feudal lords and uh, military leaders commanders chiefs like that okay but marathas now became independent because aurangzeb destroyed the deccan sultanate after the deccan uh, after the destruction of deccan sultanate these maratha rulers they become they became independent and they started taking care of their powers in their hand so out of those marathas there were few prominent families what do you mean by prominent those nobles who had lands feudal trees powers and military skills already popular in their own area okay so let's say you go to a area and you want to choose a ruler so you can see that a person who is having more lands you know a, a, a huge amount of property a good amount of treasury a good amount of military skill and people working under him then only you can choose that person as you know a prominent leader so we already had few prominent families in this area so those prominent families they you know divided things between them okay so the maratha confederacy is what confederacy it is an assemblage it is an arrangement okay where each prominent family under a chief a chief was assigned a sphere of influence okay and that particular area was according to their own rule so there the chief will maintain the law and order and they will also collect the taxes okay so now each and every area had a chief okay and these chiefs had a sphere of influence where he was supposed to conquer and rule okay but in the name of then maratha king shahu who was released by the mughal prison okay who was released by the moguls bahadur shah who became the ruler in 1707 followed a pacifist policy and released shahu to have a friendship back with the marathas again now you understand that shahu is the emperor he is the maratha king but shahu okay is not ruling shahu ji is just ruling but he is not uh, controlling the powers okay he on behalf of shahu peshwa is ruling okay and chiefs maratha chiefs are ruling in their own areas so now let's under, uh, understand how the areas were there 
uh, one Maratha chiefs who were there, Gaikwads. So Gaikwads used to rule from Baroda. Okay, Bhosle were from Nagpur, Holkars from Indore, Sindhyas from Gwalior, and Peshwa from Pune. Okay, so the Peshwa, the main leader, Peshwa is the leader of Gaikwad, Bhosle, Holkar, Sindhyas. He will rule from Pune. In the map, you can see that. Here you can see this is Pune here. So Peshwa will be ruling from this part of Pune. Okay. And this is the entire part where Peshwa will take care of everything. And I want to, uh, you know, uh, make some clear statements here. You can see Bombay, Salset, Basin. Okay. These three ports are together. Bombay, Salset, Basin. Bombay, Salset, Basin. Please remember these three names because I will repeat it again and again in this topic for you. So, Bombay, Salset, Basin is here. Here you can see Surat is there, right? And here you can see Baroda. Okay. Here you can see Bhopal, right? And uh, just understand that uh, Nagpur is here, right? And then you see this is the area which is, you know, expanding. Because Mughals were not taking control of things. So, later on you will see that they will reach till Delhi. Okay. Now, come back to this particular slide and understand that they are dividing the entire area into different chiefs. With different chiefs, they would be ruling. So, Gaikwad family is influential in Baroda. Bhosle family in Nagpur. Holkar chiefs are there in Indore. Sindhyas are in Gwalior. And Peshwa himself is in Pune. So, all together, these leaders, they had a confederacy. So, now, when Bajirao I became Peshwa, he was a, a firing Peshwa. He only started the Hindu Padpat Shahi. So, his rule was very nice, okay, very dominant. And uh, Maratha power was rising. Marathas were doing very, very good. But after Bajirao I, we see, from Bajirao I to Madhavrao I, means till the time of... Uh, the third battle of Panipat and 10 years after the third battle of Panipat, you will see things were going fine. So, from Bajirao 1 to Madhavrao 1, things were fine and uh, this Peshwa ship, this office, this confederacy worked very uh, cordially. But after the third battle of Panipat in 1761, scenario changed. The power got declined because in the third battle of Panipat, we see that Marathas got a defeat. And after the defeat of Marathas, uh, you know, uh, the young Peshwa, Madhavra won. After 10 years, he died due to TB. He, he didn't die in the third battle of Panipat. Don't get confused. Even you see that uh, uh, Balaji Bajira was also not died in the battle. They died, but later on they died. Okay. Uh, so, Madhav Rao died after 10 years. So, he was able to rule the Peshwa ship even after uh, the Battle of Panipat for more than 10 years. So, he died in 1772. So, you can see a difference of 10 to 11 years is there, right? In 1761, the Battle of Panipat. See, I don't want you to uh, mug up all the dates, but if the dates are easy to remember and if you can just relate it, then just try to cover the date there, uh, you know, on the spot. And if you will just ignore the date, then you won't understand the history. So, I don't want to, uh, I don't want you to mug up the dates, but I don't want you to ignore also, right? So, don't ignore the dates, try to relate it. So, 1761, 11 years after 1772, when Madhav Rao 1 died. So, Madhav Rao 1 died and after Madhav Rao 1, his brother Narayan Rao became the next Peshwa, okay? So, after the death of Madhav Rao, the control of Peshwa Confederacy, it got declined. Okay. So, can you understand the name Baji Rao, Madhav Rao and the death of Madhav Rao? If you forgot, just come back to this part again and look at this slide. Look at this slide. Balaji Vishwanath, first Peshwa. His son Baji Rao one, second after him Balaji uh, Baji Rao. From Balaji Baji Rao to Madhav Rao one, things are fine. After the death of Madhav Rao, the Peshwa power will decline because 
After Madhav Rao, Narayan Rao, his brother, became the next Peshwa, but Narayan Rao was killed by Raghunath Rao. Raghunath Rao is uncle, Chacha Bhatija. Okay? He is the nephew of Raghunath Rao. So Raghunath Rao will get his nephew murdered to get the throne of Peshwa ship. But he he didn't uh, he didn't knew uh, that uh, that time he, he was unaware of the fact that the uh, wife of Narayan Rao was pregnant and she gave birth to a son after few months and the son was Madhav Rao Narayan or Savai Madhav Rao Narayan his nickname was Savai so we can call him by his nickname to avoid the confusion because you see the names are repeating like Madhav Narayan uh, Rao, Rao, repeating, right? So just uh, remember Savai with the nickname. Okay, Savai is the son of Narayan Rao, uh, who will commit suicide after few years. Now let's come back to this. Here you see that Madhav uh, Rao one died in 1772, and then the Peshwa power declined. Okay, why it got declined? Because of this family conspiracy that, uh, you know, after the Madhav Rao won, Narayan Rao became the Peshwa and he was murdered. So when Narayan Rao became the Peshwa, he was murdered. Uh, he was murdered by Raghunath Rao and Raghunath Rao wanted to get the throne. But Raghunath Rao was not supported by the family. He was an incompetent ruler. So people were like, no, we understand that Raghunath Rao is not the right person to sit on the Peshwa throne. Now the family disputes got started and their Bara Bhais, those 12 chiefs of Marathas, they decided that we will consider Savai, the new infant baby, newborn infant baby to be the Peshwa. So in behalf of him, we will rule as a regent and they will be led by Nana Fadnavis. So Nana Fadnavis is like Nanaji, okay, he is like the grand person who is very, very important in the Maratha family. And he decided that, okay, uh, we will keep Savai, the new infant, newborn baby as the Peshwa and will not let the Raghunath Rao to be the Peshwa. That's why Raghunath Rao became very upset and went to get some help from English East India Company to get few soldiers and start a war against his own family members, especially Nana Fadnavis. So Raghunath Rao versus Nana Fadnavis, okay. This is going to be there in the First Anglo-Maratha War. So let's understand. First Anglo-Maratha War, the date is 1775 to 82. Do you remember the date? This is a time period when simultaneously the uh, Mesur, the First Anglo-Mesur War was also going on. And after the First Anglo-Mesur War, Second Anglo-Mesur War also started. And if you remember the date, uh, the date of 1782 by the time Heather Ali, due to cancer, died and in, uh, in place of Heather Ali, Tipu Sultan started uh, ruling and controlling the Second Anglo-Mesur War. So, uh, the rise of Heather Ali and the rise of Tipu Sultan is happening during this time only, during the First Anglo-Maratha War. So, it's like the simultaneous period. So, Britishers, as they could not control two wars together, so they decided to just, uh, you know, have a peace treaty signed in the with the Marathas that for 20 years we will not fight and uh, they will settle down Marathas very nicely. You will see it after the first Anglo-Maratha war so that they could focus on Mysore and defeat Tipu Sultan. It was the strategy of Britishers. Now understand. The background is, after the death of Madhav Rao in 1772, his brother Narayan Rao succeeded the throne. But Narayan Rao was the fifth Peshwa. Uh, but, uh, you know, he was killed by uh, Raghunath Rao. Ra Narayan Rao's uncle Raghunath Rao had his nephew assassinated. So, Raghunath Rao killed Narayan Rao. And after the death of Narayan Rao, 12 Maratha chiefs decided, Barabhai decided, that we will name the infant as the new Peshwa. Infant is the son of Narayan Rao. Okay. Son of Narayan Rao. So, his name is Madhav Narayan Rao. Nickname is Savai. So, in uh, understand that infant name is Savai. Savai Madhav Narayan Rao. Okay. So, they decided that this infant will be uh, the new Peshwa and we can rule in behalf of him till he, uh, you know, gets the adult age and then once he will be mature enough, then we will let him sit on the throne. Otherwise, till that time, uh, Nana Fadnavis with Barabhai 
as a regent can take care of the peshwa seat okay it was decided due to this decision raghunath rao became very upset and furious and went to take help from eic and signed a treaty treaty of surat in the treaty of surat raghunath rao got assistance from bombay east india company here we see that there is a clash among the east india company governors also that each and every governor wanted to have more and more power like we see in the calcutta council robert clive how he led the war uh, in the battle of plassey and then in battle of buxar the way robert clive became the nawab of bengal and then the way calcutta council was rising that bengal presidency became so strong and so powerful similarly bombay presidency also wanted to be powerful and that's why they signed this treaty with raghunath rao bombay presidency was waiting to get similar powers like bengal and they got this opportunity by raghunath rao and that's why the treaty of surat was signed raghunath rao gave some territories like selset and bisin i hope you remember i just you know uh, you know showed these two locations in the map of india so i hope you remember that we just covered it in the map selset bisin tell me what was the name of the third port which was near to selset and bisin the third location which we covered on the map we just covered it so you can tell me in the comment section Yes, uh, there is a question that क्या वो मराठास जो हैं वो तब तक होलकर गायकवाड़ सिंधिया में डिवाइड हो चुके थे Yes, uh, basically uh, तब तक नहीं बल्कि वो पहले से ही uh, ये डिसाइड कर चुके थे that हर एक एरिया में जो इम्पोर्टेंट चीफ है वो रूल करेगा तो so, वो लोग डिवाइडेड नहीं हैं but they have decided to rule in their own areas. Okay, you can't say that they were divided. this maratha family this maratha confederacy which we have just covered this is not the division okay it's not the separation they all are together but they are just taking care of their own responsibilities ki apne apne area ka dhyan rakhenge so that acche se marathas kaam kar sake isiliye so this is not the division or separation it's like a uh, you know it's like a separation of power to rule things in a very good clear way okay now understand we covered one more point here on the map let's come back to the map this is the map where i just showed you basin selset bombay so first we will have the bombay after bombay selset after selset basin so remember bombay selset basin clear fine so we have just covered it in the map so which two ports were given by raghunath rao to bombay east india company from raghunath rao to bombay selset and basin okay selset and basin bombay was already there with east india company who gave bombay to english east india company do you remember we covered it in the last class portuguese gave bombay to east india company as a dowry because prince charles married catherine the portuguese princess so as a dowry already the portuguese government gave bombay to eic so already eic had bombay with them so bombay was already there in bombay bombay eic was there and selset and basin was also now in their own control so they are very happy that three most important coastal areas are under their control now the question is why raghunath rao went to bombay eic why not calcutta council why didn't he go to bengal why didn't he sign a treaty directly with calcutta why with bombay presidency he signed it raghunath rao went to bombay why because look at the maratha dominion maratha state is here so it's easy for them to move in this particular side they were a part uh, and having a big part of the western india so that's why they considered that it's very easy for them to get the access in the bombay and uh, due to location and due to the convenience right it was more convenient for them to go and sign a treaty with bombay and that's why they went to bombay simultaneously 
uh, I just want you to see this particular part of Anglo Mysore War. If you remember, we covered the Anglo Mysore War, and if you can see the first Anglo Mysore War, where you know uh, Hyder Ali was there, who suddenly appeared on the gate of Madras. So from 1767 to 69, you can see that they already had a war with. Hyder Ali in Mysore, and after the first Anglo-Mysore War, the second Anglo-Mysore War is 1780 to 84. Can you see 1780 to 84? This is the time when already, you know, the dispute is going on in the Mysore. And uh, if you remember, in 1782 only, Hyder Ali died, and Tipu Sultan started taking control over the uh, wars and things like that. So, seventeen eighty to eighty four is the time of Second Anglo Mysore War, and then you see that uh, you know in seven in Third Anglo Mysore War also in seventeen ninety two he they signed the treaty. So, just remember that the death of uh, Tipu Sultan will be on seventeen ninety nine. So, seventeen ninety nine is the end of Anglo Mysore War. So, after seventeen ninety nine only the EIC will take care of any other state. Okay, they will not interfere in any other part because they were focusing on Mysore. After killing Tipu Sultan, they will consider any other location in India because they only wanted to focus on Mysore initially. So understand, here we uh, got the point that Raghunath Rao was the uh, you know ambitious Peshwa, and he declared himself Peshwa, signed a treaty with Bombay, and gave them. uh bombay east india company was given uh, salset and basin okay till now the story is clear so raghunath rao ceded the territories of salset and basin to eic along with a portion of the revenues from surat and baruch district very high level of revenue was collected from surat and baruch so you can see that all the coastal powers okay all the coastal powers are under the control of bombay eic the west coast the western side of india would be in the hands of bombay eic in return what english will give uh, raghunath rao so english were to provide raghunath rao with 2500 soldiers okay and help raghunath rao assist raghunath rao in going with the war okay against nana fadnavis okay so it was a big clear strategy here you will see that the british calcutta council okay on the other side was not happy with this treaty of surat they condemned this treaty of surat in 1775 and they sent colonel upton to pune to annul it okay to cancel it cancel the treaty and make a new treaty cancel the treaty and make a new treaty treaty of purandhar which was signed in 1776 next year okay so here 1776 the new treaty was signed with the regency where they renounced raghunath rao and they said that we will not consider raghunath rao as the peshwa we will give him a pension and we will just you know uh, have a distance with raghunath rao so now raghunath rao was sidelined okay now raghunath rao was sidelined and the bombay government was not happy with this decision they rejected this and they gave refuge to raghunath rao they said okay we will give refuge to raghunath rao because he came to us so that's why if bombay government is giving refuge to raghunath rao is it not against this treaty of purandhar yes or no like calcutta council eic decided that they will renounce raghunath rao leave him and promised him a pension right but what bombay is doing bombay is still rejecting the entire order and giving refuge to raghunath rao so giving refuge to raghunath rao is against the treaty of purandhar yes or no it is against the treaty of purandhar yes it is against the treaty of purandhar that they should have not given any refuge to raghunath rao it's like violating the treaty right it's the violation and that's why due to this violation marathas chiefs bara bhai especially nana fadnavis they became very angry that 
these people are of no use they are for no trust they are not taking care of the treaty and that's why next year in 1777 nana fadnavis violated his treaty with the calcutta council and granted french a port on the west coast if you remember french were enemies of britishers right there was already a anglo french rivalry going on and we already have covered the anglo carnatic wars we have seen that during the american revolution when america wanted independence french sided with america against britain right french used to uh, you know help america and any other country uh, who used to go against britain because french and britishers they had a clash right so that's why you need to understand here that giving access to french on the west coast or you know providing them them any kind of coast or area to enter into the india is against eic against english and that's why britishers were so unhappy that how could you help our enemies french are enemies of english if you are giving them access then that is very bad and that's why english retaliated by sending a force towards pune okay when they will send the force to pune there would be a battle and then the battle of talegaon is going to be there where you know uh, mahaji shindeya was there mahaji shinde he we can call him mahaji shinde also who was commander so he lured uh, english in talegaon and they all uh, you know came to the area of that hilly region uh, where marathas defeated the english army so uh, basically they defeated english army why because uh, they were uh, marathas were good in the guerrilla warfare techniques and uh, they knew how to fight in the hilly areas uh, so the guerrilla warfare technique is a technique where uh, you can you know uh, uh, fight against the enemy by uh, sometimes attacking from sides and behinds and in the forest area when there are so many trees and uh, you know bushes and uh, you know hilly areas are there so you know it's easy uh, for a person to slide and attack from somewhere and you know a sudden attack could be there so these kind of you know jungly attacks or uh, jungly ladai so this jungly ladai was very uh, common in marathas and they knew about these jungly ladais but the problem was that in the third uh, third battle of panipat uh, they got defeated now question is when they were so powerful that they could defeat the english army then how could they got defeated in the third battle of panipat the reason is that panipat was a open ground okay it was not a hilly area so in panipat they could not perform their guerrilla warfare techniques and those skills were of no use uh, in the plain area of panipat but it was a very useful skill in the talegaon so uh, when the you know force came to pune when the english force came to pune you will see that you know uh, ultimately uh, this war would be continued and the struggle would go on so now the course of war is from pune to talegaon the war was going on and on and on uh, they continued to fight and marathas also utilized the scorched earth policy in which they uh, you know they burnt all the uh, farm lands crops and everything to be eaten no edible item was there no crops were there in the area uh, and they also poisoned the wells so that the water is so poisonous that in case eic soldiers will drink the water they will die so so many uh, soldiers died by, uh, before even uh, you know fighting or uh, before even coming to the uh, you know real battle so uh, it's it's a, it was a great strategy by marathas by burning the farmlands poisoning the wells and then english began to withdraw from talegaon they understood that it's impossible for them to win so they started going out of talegaon then marathas attacked them again and they were like no you need to retreat to the village of wardgaon and then they came to wardgaon again the war was continuing uh, continuing uh, you know english ultimately surrendered that okay fine we can't you know fight with you like this and then in mid of the january in 1779 eic signed the treaty of wardgaon that forced the bombay government to relinquish all the territories acquired by the english since 1775 do you remember the date and the importance of 1775 the importance of 1775 is the treaty by raghunath rao the treaty of surat 
that's why this date is important 1775 is important because of the treaty of surat because he gave two important ports who gave raghunath rao raghunath rao gave two territories to bombay eic please give me the names of those two territories those two ports near bombay i hope you remember that thank you so much guys thank you so much for your beautiful comments yes bilkul sahi kaha abhishek ne ki angrez hum indians ko kehte the ki dowry mangte hain lekin khud wo dahej mein bombay de deya karte the aur is tarike ki cheeze karte the yes uh, here a very important thing is that uh, you know ye angrezon ki aadat thi ki wo bhartiya logon ko hamesha neecha dikhate the they used to downgrade indians what britishers used to say that they are here to civilize indians because indians are fighting indians are having caste problem superstitious beliefs and so many social evils are there in india so britishers are there to purify indians civilize indians but in reality if you compare the problems of european countries which they have then you would be shocked to see that the way they discriminated in their own society if you read about the dark age in the medieval times uh, where you know the society was divided and discriminated so ruthlessly a lot of superstition was there in the society they were so backward and you know uh, they uh, if you compare the level of hygiene also indians are more hygienic than europeans okay they just have a fair skin because of their climatic condition it is not because of hygiene right so this is a misconception that the western culture is more hygienic and fine no they had a very harsh climatic area in europe even today it is a very harsh climate it's a very cold climate and uh, you know that in cold climate what happens hai na jab sardi hoti hai तो आप सबको ही पता है कि क्या होता है ना सर्दी में तो लोग नहाना भी अवॉइड करते हैं तो कितनी सारी प्रॉब्लम्स होती हैं सो ऑफ कोर्स दे ऑलरेडी हैड अ लॉट ऑफ प्रॉब्लम्स इन देयर सोसाइटी द डिस्क्रिमिनेशन बिटवीन ब्लैक एंड वाइट्स द फ्रेंच रेवोल्यूशन व्हिच हैपन बिकॉज ऑफ फर्स्ट सेकेंड एंड थर्ड स्टेट डिविजन बिकॉज ओनली थर्ड स्टेट वॉज पेइंग द टैक्सेज सो दैट हाई लेवल ऑफ डिस्क्रिमिनेशन एंड पॉवर्टी विच वॉज देयर इन फ्रेंच एंड इन यू नो ड्यू टू विच फ्रेंच रेवोल्यूशन हैपन इन द वे रशियन रेवोल्यूशन हैपन the problem of monarchy the ruthless nature of hitler all those things are there in europe only right nothing is there in india indians were so peaceful and happy people so self sufficient but it's just the way of writing the history in the colonial approach that they write it like that so a treaty of salset and basin it was returned to the marathas okay salset and basin these two areas were there okay right shruti prajapati you gave the right answer okay uh smiling you have said that we still follow the culture as we are downgrading uh, no we are not downgrading the country uh, of course no uh, just understand that uh, we have a western influence today but sometimes now we uh, follow few things because of the convenience and a habit okay sometimes you get into a habit of doing something uh, like if you use western washroom you will not feel uh, very uh, you know comfortable in the indian washroom it it doesn't mean that you don't like the indian culture it's like you feel more comfortable sitting on a western seat than into the indian seat it's like that so it's all about comfort and habits now, right now also about the branding today we live in a global world right so today it's globalization everywhere it's branding everywhere so now it's all about following uh, the global brands being international and uh, the concept of nationalism which was there in the uh, you know uh, modern times or in the modern world history or in the modern indian history is now changing okay from the feeling of nationalism there is a new feeling of globalism right in which we are being very global and the concept is being very interna international style is imposed on the minds of indians now let's come to the uh, this treaty come back to the topic okay anglo maratha struggle for supremacy where you understood that the treaty was signed okay 
so the treaty of badgaon was signed and according to this treaty uh, bombay had to relinquish salset and basin and all the areas of surat baroch where they acquired taxes from raghunath rao so they gave back everything but it was not the ending of first anglo maratha war because britishers still continued and persuaded marathas okay to you know sign uh, a new treaty so ultimately to end everything the treaty of salbai was signed in 1782 okay here warren hastings the governor general of bengal by that time if you remember that governor gen governor of bengal became governor general of bengal means that governor of bengal can issue and make treaties in behalf of bombay and madras so the powers from the bombay presidency and madras presidency came under the control the legislative rights came under the control of uh, bengal so uh, now the governor of bengal became governor general of bengal and then he will become governor general of india and then viceroy of india okay so now you see the power of the governor of bengal has been increased okay he is not just the governor of bengal but the governor general of bengal he is having more powers so warren hastings said that no i am the governor general okay i am more pow powerful than bombay and madras so i reject this treaty of wadgaon okay i will send a new large force and he sent it under a uh, colonel uh, godard so colonel Go godard was there and he captured ahmedabad in february 1799 he captured basin again in december 1780 and then captain fofam came captain fofam captured gwalior in august 1780 and in february 1781 english general uh, you know general kamek defeated sindhias at sipri okay so all those maratha chiefs they got defeated so sindhia proposed a new treaty between peshwa and english which was known as the treaty of salbai they signed the treaty of salbai in 1782 and they both decided to have a peace so in 1782 you see that by imposing so many new colonels and governors and military generals in different parts uh, english got the victory they considered that they uh, they they were able to suppress this maratha aggression but they could not handle two wars simultaneously they wanted the help from marathas in mysore so to get help from marathas in mysore they decided to solve it peacefully with marathas and they signed a peace treaty of salbai in 1782 because it was the time when tipu sultan was rising okay so to defeat tipu sultan it was the strategy of eic to kill tipu sultan it was the strategy of eic to take help from marathas here let's see few important locations please come to this map carefully this is indore gwalior badoda pune satara nagpur basin salset bombay okay you need to remember these locations very very important extremely important okay just understand this here you see that bengal is here right so this is the uh, reference of maratha empire and we see how you know different chiefs were there gwalior indore baroda nagpur pune ultimately in the end all of them they would lose their powers and in the end of anglo maratha struggle uh, it would be confined only to satara that's why satara is important fine now let's continue the discussion uh, this map is important just remember these locations now come uh, back to the treaty of salbai so treaty of salbai was signed in 1782 it is the same time period when the second anglo mysore war was going on so according to this treaty of salbai first of all salset should remain in the possession of english okay the way salset was given during the time of raghunath rao they still wanted to have salset in their own control 
the whole of the territory conquered since the treaty of purandhar in 1776 including basin should be restored to marathas like marathas will get other powers other territories other areas back to them but not sell it okay so marathas got basin back to them but sells it was still in the control of eic i hope you are getting the point see basin is under the marathas but sells it was now in control of eic okay got it understand the map you will understand everything now according to this treaty of salbai there was a third provision that in gujarat fateh singh gaikwad will remain in the possession of the territory which he had before the war and should serve the peshwa as before why because they wanted to restore peace in the maratha confederacy the english should not offer any further support to raghunath rao and the peshwa should grant him a maintenance allowance hyder ali should return all the territory taken from english and nawab of arcot because if you know that hyder ali during this first anglo maratha war was trying to neutralize marathas if you remember in the first anglo mysore war there was a triple alliance when eic took help from marathas and nizam of hyderabad but hyder ali understood that there is a secret alliance going on so hyder ali decided to pay more to marathas and help them to neutralize marathas so that marathas won't fight against hyder ali so hyder ali uh, you know came in friendship with marathas and was trying to help marathas against eic and he was also trying to help nizam of uh, hyderabad so that's why hyder ali got included in this area hyder ali should return all the territory taken from english and the nawab of arcot why because hyder ali with the nawab of hyderabad nizam of hyderabad uh, went to arcot and uh, took few territories and decided to share with the nizam of hyderabad just to uh, have a friendship with the nizam and marathas but uh, here it was decided that he will return everything back mahaji shindia or mahaji shinde was the commander so he should be mutual guarantor for the proper observance of the terms of the treaty that everyone follows this treaty of salbai now look at the date very very important treaty of salbai in 1782 remember 1782 treaty of salbai second anglo maratha war 1803 to 1805 can you see a gap of 20 years why there was a gap of 20 years after the treaty of salbai in the first anglo maratha war you see that the treaty of salbai was signed so the gap between first and second anglo maratha war the gap is very huge 20 years gap why because eic wanted to focus on mysore for 20 years they wanted to defeat tipu sultan so for 20 years they decided to have peace and destroy mysore and after destroying mysore they will come back to maratha fine and that's why for 20 years they decided to maintain the peace okay and if you remember they killed tipu sultan and after killing tipu sultan in shirangpatnam in the battle of shirangpatnam they decided to come back i'll just go back to the slide yesterday uh, the way we covered it so if you remember the state fourth anglo mysore war in 1799 they defeated tipu sultan so in 1799 they were free eic ka dimag free ho gaya चलो मार दिया आप टीपू सुल्तान को अब मैसूर से ध्यान हटा के हम मराठा को फोकस करेंगे अब हम मराठा को हराएंगे मैसूर को तो मार दिया मैसूर खत्म अब मराठा को खत्म करो ठीक है तो दैट्स वाई सेवेंटी नाइनटी नाइन तक ये लोग कुछ नहीं करेंगे एंड दे विल कम टू मराठा बैक आफ्टर किलिंग टीपू सुल्तान एंड दैट्स वाई दे वेटेड फॉर ट्वेंटी ईयर्स clear fine those of you who have not liked this video 
अभी तक जिन्होंने लाइक नहीं किया यू गाइस प्लीज लाइक इट ओके एंड शेयर इट विद योर फ्रेंड्स नाउ कम बैक जो स्टूडेंट्स बीच में आए हैं यू शुड नो दैट वी आर लाइव एवरी डे एट एट ओ क्लॉक सो यू नीड टू कम ऑन टाइम बी रेगुलर इन द क्लास अंडरस्टैंड दैट इन दी सेकेंड एंग्लो मराठा वॉर फ्रॉम एटीन जीरो थ्री टू एटीन जीरो फाइव वी सॉ दैट हाउ थिंग्स वर देव नाउ द डेथ ऑफ नाना फडनविस हैपेंड इन एटीन हंड्रेड हु वॉज नाना फडनविस कैन यू टेल मी द रोल ऑफ नाना फडनविस वट वॉज द इम्पॉर्टेंस ऑफ नाना फडनविस वट ही वॉज डूइंग ही वॉज द पर्सन हु डिसाइडेड दैट सवाई माधव नारायण राव द इन्फेंट बेबी विल बिकम द पेशवा अगेंस्ट रघुनाथ राव He was the one who used to be against Raghunath Rao every time. He was the one leading the Bara Bhai. He was the leader of Bara Bhai. So, what do you think? The death of Nana Fadnavis would be good for Marathas or bad for Marathas? Tell me in the comment section. I want you guys to comment. Okay, I am waiting for your comments. Tell me. Till then, I am drinking a little water. You guys, tell me. नाना फडनविस की मौत मराठास के लिए अच्छी रहेगी या बुरी रहेगी इट वुड बी गुड और बैड यस इट वुड बी वेरी वेरी बैड राइट इट्स अ वेरी प्रॉब्लमैटिक थिंग So Nana Fadnavis died in 1800. What will ha happen after his death? After his death, son of Raghunath Rao, Baji Rao too, uh, he was the Peshwa. He became very, uh, you know, irresponsible and ruthless. He started fighting against his cousins. He started killing everyone. He started uh, having wars and battles whenever he liked. Okay. so that's why it created a huge problem and destruction after the death of nana fadnavis because you will see that the death of nana fadnavis gave the british an added advantage ek extra advantage mil gaya britishers ko so now the course of war is the second anglo maratha war is happening again because of the son of raghunath rao you knew that who started the first anglo maratha war raghunath rao right raghunath rao started the first anglo maratha war by signing the treaty of surat right and you will see that baji rao too the son of raghunath rao will also start the second anglo maratha war by signing a treaty with eic again same problem history repeats itself Now you see the son is doing same the way father did, because he was from seventeen ninety six to eighteen eighteen he was the Peshwa and during his Peshwa ship only Nana Fadnavis died. Now the question is why Raghunath Rao became the Peshwa? Why uh, sorry why the son of Raghunath Rao became the Peshwa? Why not Savai? Because by that time, if you remember, I told you that Savai Madhav Narayan Rao. the infant baby committed suicide and that's why uh, by hereditary right uh, the son of raghunath rao became the next peshwa so the war starts from the 1st april 1801 when peshwa baji rao to brutally murdered the brother of jaswant rao holkar vithu ji okay so he brutally murdered the brother of jaswant rao holkar so he is against the holkars Do you remember Holkars? Who were Holkars? Holkars were ruling from which area? I hope you remember the Maratha Confederacy. Holkars, I told you. Holkars, Sindhya. If you remember, look at this map. Holkars were from Indore, and Sindhyas were from Gwalior. Right? Holkars were from Indore. and sindhyas were from gwalior and sindhyas were very very powerful also remember this now you will see holkars who ruled from indore look at the map here you can see indore here from indore holkars were ruling and from gwalior sindhyas were ruling 
दे गॉट इन कॉन्फ्लिक्ट विद द पेशवा बाजी राव टू ड्यूरिंग द सेकेंड एंग्लो मराठा वॉर ओके सो दिस इज अ वॉर बिटवीन ओके दीज थ्री पीपल नाउ कम बैक टू द स्लाइड अंडरस्टैंड दिस अंडरस्टैंड द स्टोरी सो वॉट इज हैपनिंग दैट जसवंत राव होलकर who was the chief from indore was very very powerful was in clash against the baji rao to the peshwa so baji rao to killed vithu ji brother of jaswant rao holkar so that's why jaswant rao holkar was very very upset he was furious and he wanted to have a war against peshwa so jaswant rao holkar you know he started uh, you know uh, having a battle against uh, the peshwa he arrayed his forces against the combined army of sindhya and baji rao too okay sindhya from gwalior and baji rao too the peshwa from pune they are together so they are sindhya and baji rao too they both are together in this area you will see the turmoil continued and on 25th october 1802 jaswant rao holkar defeated the armies combined armies of peshwas and sindhya decisively at hadaspur near pune okay and after defeating baji rao too he placed vinayak rao the son of amrita rao on the peshwa seat so vinayak rao is here in this picture vinayak rao is the son of amrita rao do you remember vinayak rao and amrita rao if you don't remember come to this slide please come here vinayak rao amrita rao okay so raghunath rao had two sons baji rao to and amrit rao okay and here vinayak rao became the peshwa because baji rao to killed the uh, you know brother of jaswant rao holkar and that's why jaswant rao holkar started a war against baji rao to baji rao to was defeated near pune uh, in the hadaspur and in this battle baji rao to was defeated with sindhyas and that's why vinayak rao became the next peshwa so when vinayak rao became the next peshwa baji rao to to get help signed a treaty with eic okay because he wanted to start a war against and get protection against vinayak rao that's why okay now let's understand this vinayak rao son of amrita rao became uh, the peshwa now baji rao to went to basin if you remember basin the area where you know uh, already eic was there so on 31st december 1802 he signed the treaty with english and the treaty was known as the treaty of basin do you remember basin is the port bombay salset basin right so there the treaty of basin was signed with eic this treaty of basin is the a uh, very big mistake you can say by which peshwa himself served the entire maratha confederacy in the platter to eic marathas ko ek plate mein pados ke de diya gaya angrezon ko ki ye lo ji aapka ho gaya maratha confederacy puri tarah se because this treaty of basin is not just a treaty it is a subsidiary alliance by mistake baji rao to he signed subsidiary alliance hai to ye subsidiary alliance but naam tha treaty of basin because see eic never wanted to show directly that we are doing subsidiary alliance with you okay so indirectly by this treaty of basin they had few uh, points in this treaty which is very similar to subsidiary alliance look at the points number 1 according to this treaty of basin uh, he will uh, the peshwa the peshwa means baji rao to who is the defeated peshwa now baji rao to uh, will receive a native infantry army of eic consisting of 
not lo less than 6,000 troops, around 6,000 soldiers with the usual portion of field artillery and European artillery, uh, all the men, weapon attached to it, permanently stationed in his territory. Permanently stationed. Army permanently stationed. Is it a part of subsidiary alliance or not? It used to be a point in subsidiary alliance, right? Second, he will give company, uh, you know, territories uh, yielding an income of 26 lakhs. So, a lot of areas were given to AIC. Um, Peshwa will surrender the city of Surat completely. He will give up all the claims for Choth on the Nizam's dominion on Hyderabad. He will accept company's arbitration in all differences between him and the Nizam or the Gayakwads because whenever there is any dispute, company will decide that what the Peshwa needs to do. Uh, he will not keep in, in, in his employment any other European of any other nation, especially you know that French, right? French were the enemies of English. So, English never wanted any other company like French EIC or Dutch EIC to, you know, have any friendship. So, not to keep in his employment Europeans of any nation at war with the English and the subject, uh, to subject his relations with other states to be controlled uh, by the English. So, yes, it would be in the control of English. So, English can only decide that what uh, Baji Rao to Peshwa will do or what he will not do. So, it's very similar to subsidiary alliance, right? So, in the subsidiary alliance also, same kind of provisions used to be there. So, if you look at the provisions of Treaty of Basin, it is like a subsidiary alliance. By this Treaty of Basin, the Peshwa power was completely destroyed. It was reduced to a vassalage after the Peshwa accepted subsidiary alliance, which is in the Treaty of Basin. Now, Peshwa, when he lost all the powers, he lost Surat, territories, money, army, everything, then he realized that he has committed a big mistake. Now, Baji Rao to realize that he was going against his own family members. He himself and his father in past was wrong. But it was too late. This realization came. He was very sorry. He was feeling very, very sorry. And he went to meet his own family members and other chiefs and decided to start a war again against the Britishers, which was the third Anglo-Maratha war, but it was too late, okay. So now Sindhyas and Bhosle, they attempted to save the Maratha independence, okay. They tried to understand that we can have a war again, but the well-prepared and organized English army, which was under Arthur Wellesley, Arthur Wellesley, if you remember, he was there in the anglo mysore war also. Okay, in the fourth anglo mysore war, we have seen Arthur Wellesley, right? So, Arthur Wellesley, uh, you know, they defeated the combined armies of Sindhya, Bhonsle and forced them to conclude sub, uh, separate subsidiary alliance uh, with English. And in 1804, Yashwant Rao Holkar was made an attempt, uh, he made an attempt to form a coalition again with other Indian rulers to fight against EIC. But this attempt was unsuccessful. The Marathas were defeated and they were reduced to British vessels and they were isolated from one another. All the chiefs were isolated and they were not able to do anything. Because of this treaty of Basin, basically, uh, by keeping the English troops permanently and, you know, uh, giving so many territories and strategic locations to EIC, you see that the company already had troops in Mysore. They already had troops in Hyderabad. They were already having everything in Lucknow. So, it was very easy for the company to, you know, bring the army and soldiers from wherever they wanted. It was very easy for them. And the addition of Pune on the list means that company's troops were now more evenly spread in the entire western and south India. So, they could be rushed to any place. Whenever it was needed, they could come to any area without much delay and they could fight and start the war. So, the Treaty of Basin did not hand over the India to the company on a platter, but it was a major development because company was now well placed to expand its area and influence. So, in this circumstances, you see the observation that the treaty gave English the key to India, the key to India, this Treaty of Basin was a very big mistake by Baji Rao too. Okay. So, this is very much understandable. So, this is something 
uh, which you can uh, see as a problematic defeat of Marathas. Now, in the third Anglo-Maratha war, these Maratha chiefs and Baji Rao too decided and realized his mistake, came together, these family members decided that we will not fight and we should together at last try for the very last time if we can do something. So the background is Lord Hastings was there and he was very imperialistic by his nature. He wanted to have a British paramount state and he used to follow it very strictly that Britishers should be the paramount power everywhere. By the Charter Act of 1813, EIC's, uh, you know, company's monopoly on the trade in China except tea was ended and hence company needed more markets. So if you remember, if you read the Charter Act of 1813, it was towards the centralization of India. And in this Charter Act, they uh, wanted that more, uh, you know, uh, worker, uh, uh, more business people, uh, you know, uh, owners, plantation owners should come to India and they should expand the business. So the monopoly was ended, the EIC monopoly was ended. So new companies came here new markets they needed and they wanted more territories and that's why they became core imperialist by nature. Here the problem was that see everything was going in peace but Marathas uh, they ha used to employ Pindaris. What do you mean by Pindaris? Pindaris uh, they were the group of soldiers who used to work uh, on the basis of payment like you can say freelancers, soldiers who are freelancers. So. जब भी पैसा मिलेगा जाएंगे और लड़ाई करेंगे जो पैसा देगा उसी के साथ चले जाएंगे ओके सो पिंडारीज दे वर वेरी रूथलेस बट दे वर वेरी गुड सोल्जर्स राइट एंड दे यूज टू वर्क फॉर मराठास बट एज वी कैन सी दैट आफ्टर सेकेंड एंग्लो मराठा वॉर एंड आफ्टर द ट्रीटी ऑफ बसीन मराठास हैड नो पावर सो मराठा कुड नॉट स्टार्ट एनी बैटल और फाइट और डू एनी थिंग सो मराठास वर लाइक having no power and no battle to be there so no future planning no military was needed and that's why pindaris got unemployed because pindaris used to fight in the maratha army only okay so they were people made by many caste and classes they were attached to the maratha armies and um, uh, mercenaries but now they became uh, very very uh, weak and unemployed because marathas were weak now so pindaris could not get regular source of employment no regular payment was there so these pindaris they became daku okay they started looting people they started uh, illegal activities so now they started pl plundering the neighboring territories including the territories of eic so eic said that pindaris are directed by marathas so it is by the marathas that pindaris are coming and attacking in the area of eic and that's why eic english east india company charged maratha with giving shelter to Pindaris and uh, you know it was said that you only you know give shelter to Pindaris and you guys are only making Pindaris do these things and plundering and all so Marathas are responsible of uh, this behavior so they just wanted to have an excuse now Pindari leaders like Amir Khan and Kareem Khan they surrendered but there was one more leader Chitu Khan who fled into the jungles ultimately this problem got very complex later and uh, now you know uh, these Maratha chiefs when they saw that uh, they are getting humiliated in front of Pindaris and everywhere uh, you know they are having no respect remaining then they decided to start a war. So basically the third Anglo-Maratha war here is happening because of the humiliating treaty of Basin where Maratha leaders had no power, no respect, their feelings you know, the, the feelings were wounded now and it, it was the absolute surrender of independence. Lord Hastings against Pindaris was seen as a transgression uh, over the sovereignty of Marathas because Lord Hastings was taking very strict actions against Pindaris and that's why Maratha Confederacy united again and repentment of Baji Rao too was also there. He was also repenting his mistakes that yes, he did something more, uh, wrong and for the last time he, they tried to come together in 1817 and all the Maratha chiefs started the third Anglo-Maratha war together but they were all defeated together okay in the course of war the peshwa attacked british residency at pune and appa sahib was attacking uh, you know from nagpur he attacked the residency in nagpur so the residency was attacked holkar made some preparation 
for the war in their own area in indore and but they all of them you know they got defeated in their own areas because so see there was no power remaining in them right so those elements were not there they all got defeated the political and administrative condition of all the maratha states were confused and inefficient now they had no control no organized army and nothing remaining in their hand after the death of jaswant rao holkar tulsi bai you know the holkar's favorite mistress she was you know uh, taking care of the empire but uh, she was you know also not uh, good in uh, helping things in a political way so ultimately pune was not having good affairs inside the governance of the pune and that's why the peshwa got defeated at khirki bhosle got defeated at sitabuldi holkar's at mahindpur and few important treaties were signed separately with them okay so june 1817 was the day when the treaty of pune with peshwa was signed in november 1870 with gwalior and you know treaty of uh, gwalior was signed with sindhya and in january 1818 the treaty of mandasore was signed with holkars so ultimately with them all with different chiefs separate treaties were signed in june 1818 peshwa finally surrendered everything the confederacy was dissolved the peshwa ship was abolished and it was decided that no more peshwa ship is going to be there it was abolished and peshwa baji rao uh, became the british retainer at bithur which is near kanpur and then he was having no power at all pratap singh he was a lineal descendant of shivaji maharaj so uh, pratap singh you know he became the person who can uh, have a small territory as a prince to you know rule a small area uh, so a small principality satara was given to him which formed out of the peshwa's dominion so now uh, they were confined to satara only i showed you satara on the map i hope you remember that okay so this was the story of marathas right i hope you understood the anglo maratha wars first second and third so just remember in the first anglo maratha war raghunath rao was there he signed the treaty of surat and then the, the treaty of purandhar was signed but ultimately the treaty of salbai was signed so first anglo maratha war most important treaty is the treaty of salbai in the second anglo maratha war treaty of basin which is the subsidiary alliance equivalent to subsidiary alliance was signed with the baji rao too in the third anglo maratha war separate treaties with all the separate chiefs were signed and the treaty of pune was signed with the peshwa and the peshwa ship was abolished and you know pratap singh the lineal uh, descendant of shivaji maharaj got a small principality in satara so maratha family got destroyed maratha peshwa ship got destroyed only satara was remaining in their hands nothing else done so we have understood the fall of bengal by uh, battle of plassey and buxar fall of mysore a uh, fall of arcot you have already covered hyderabad already signed the subsidiary alliance now come to north west india okay we have covered uh, you know this area bengal we have covered this entire area mysore maratha uh, mysore maratha and this uh, you know area of northern sarkars uh, karnataka area was already done now let's come to this area northwestern area now we will discuss uh, anglo sindh war anglo afghan war anglo uh, sikh war which was in punjab and then we'll see how you know from punjab and other areas the northwestern area will come will come under the control of britishers okay so this is something which we will see okay so now if you remember the medieval indian history In 712 AD, Arab conquest of Sindh happened. Right? Arab Arab rulers came to Sindh. Right? And when they came to Sindh, Sindh was considered like the gate of India. It's like the gate of India. If you want to enter from the northwestern side, if someone is coming from Baghdad or Red Sea, they can come to India by entering into the Sindh. So it's a very important location. Right? So if you control Sindh, you are controlling the gate of India. nobody can enter in the india so in this area sindh area eic wanted to have some power but they were not uh, you know getting it very easily so for some time they got few rights to open few factories but later on it was decided that, that they should shut down everything and go away so then you will see a problem and complexity will be there but ultimately sindh will come under the control of eic after sindh they will focus on the sikh area in the kashmir area 
so this is the story of the north western part of india now we will discuss this area right uh, until now if you have any doubts please let me know okay clear fine so anglo maratha war was fine no i hope you like the discussion on anglo maratha war i hope you remember the problem in bengal mysore maratha it is done fine so that's why we are coming to the sindh area okay so let's discuss sindh in short uh, basically in the early 19th century was uh, what was there like it is the time uh, of you can say 1800 or during the time of uh, 1800 and 1820s uh, you know english started to show some interest in sindh okay why they wanted to have the gate on their control they enjoyed some trade facilities there because they had a farman of mughal emperor so mughal emperor in 1630 gave farman to eic to have some trade facilities so farman provided eic to have some privileges in the ports of the sindh and they were enjoying it other in the other areas of india also so on the ports of the sindh also eic used to trade and exchange goods okay but what happened in this area of sindh the history will change okay can you see here baluchistan this area baluchistan right here baluch tribe used to be there okay and from here few tribals will come to the sindh area one more location punjab very very important here you can see jammu and kashmir this is the punjab state and uh, it was the area very very important area which we will discuss right now we need to focus on this area only just understand how the story starts in 1758 Okay, seventeen fifty eight. There was a English factory which was built at Thatta. Thatta is the name of a place. Okay, why? Because they got a parvana. Parvana is like a farman order. Okay, so they got a order by Kallora Prince Gulam Shah. So Kallora Prince, Kallora is the dynasty which used to rule. So Kallora Prince Gulam Shah, they gave parvana to English to have a factory. In 1761, what happened that Gulam Shah, on the arrival of an English resident in his court, not only ratified the earlier treaty but also excluded other Europeans from trading here. Means Gulam Shah in 1761 was very happy with English East India Company. He wanted only English East India Company to be there. He he wanted no French, no Russians, no Dutch, no Danes. no portuguese no what else okay he just cancelled all all the other european uh, trading facilities in the area and he just gave facilities to eic english east india company only to the britishers okay he was a very good friend of english so till 1761 things are fine now this advantage uh, was enjoyed by eic and it was going very fine till 1775 but after 1775 sarfaraz khan became the ruler okay now sarfaraz khan when he came he was like no i will not let them ru rule and you know uh, do the factories and trading activities like this so sarfaraz khan asked eic english to close their factories now english said why are you doing this okay we we are here since so long and since last 30 40 years uh, you know we were trading in this area since the time of moguls we had a lot of uh, influence and control in the trading facilities but sarfaraz khan was like no i can't let you work so you know freely like this and i want you to close your factory so at that time english could not do anything uh, and what happened in 1770s a baluch tribe called tal talpuras they came from the hilly areas and they settled in the plains of sindh so talpuras are coming from the hilly areas in 1770s okay so talpuras will come from this area okay they are baluch tribe they are coming from baluchistan this hilly this is a hilly area and they came to sindh and they got settled in the plain area so when they got settled here if you know about the hilly areas and people who are pahadis theek hai agar aapne pahadi logon ko dekha hai वो बहुत मेहनती होते हैं बस पहाड़ों पे जीवन बहुत मुश्किल होता है लाइफ इज वेरी हार्श इन माउंटेन एरियाज सो वेन पीपल हु लिव इन माउंटेन एरियाज दे कम टू द प्लेन एरिया दे आर वेरी एनर्जेटिक 
and they would be able to work more hard right they will be working harder and they have a good fighting skill also because they are very uh, habitual of living a very harsh life okay if you look at the training why you get the training in labasna in masuri why not in a plain area because if you go to a hilly area in the cold climate the you know uh, the red blood cell increases the uh, you know palpitation increases and the blood circulation also increases because you need more oxygen uh, because uh, you know with the uh, increase in height we know that uh, gases reduce oxygen reduces and the body needs more and then body tries to get more and more and that's for high circulation you know body gets more energy with it and if you come back to the plain area you would be able to work with extra energy more energy if you don't uh, understand it you can just go for a vacation stay in a hilly area for a few days and whenever you'll come back you will feel more energetic that as if you, your blood is circulating in a, a new energy and it would be a introduction of new blood cells in your body right so these people talpura amirs when they came in this area they became uh, the you know uh, the kings of this area they used to call them amirs okay so they they were uh, brothers and they just just divided this area and they used to call them chariar okay so chariar means amirs amir means lord landlord who is having a area as a big landlord and controlling a big area so amir means rich nahi hai yahan pe theek hai amir matlab hai raja okay so amir is raja amir means king so now dalpura amirs they got a great influence in this area of sindh in this new region of sindh and in 1783 these dalpuras they under the leadership of mir fateh ali khan became very powerful mir fateh ali khan he established the complete hold over sindh and he sent the kalora prince into exile if you remember kalora prince and uh, gulam shah and other rulers they used to help english east india company in opening a lot of factories and working there in a very good way right so in sindh area eic was able to control a lot because of kalora prince especially gulam shah if you remember so basically what happened uh, at that time even uh, it is a culture today that when a muslim ruler or uh, uh, you know islamic ruler gains a territory and wants to hold it they need to take some permission from a khalifa or a bigger ruler or a sultan who is very nearby so that they could you know assure this power that they are having this legitimacy to rule so to get legitimacy they took help from the durrani monarch so uh, mir fateh ali khan uh, by from that then durrani monarch com- confirmed the claims of uh, this area and uh, he got the order that yes he can share the area share the country country means sindh country means india nahi hai yahan pe country means sindh he can uh, share the country with his brothers okay so mir brothers they were popularly known as chariars they divided the entire territory among themselves and mir fateh died in 1800 after the death of mir fateh in this area these charya divided the kingdom among themselves and they started calling them amirs or the lords of the sindh okay these lord of the sindh when they were ruling uh, they started expanding the rule by going and capturing the other neighboring areas so they first conquered amar court if you remember this is the area where akbar was born right akbar uh if uh, you don't know that humayu was in exile for 15 years we covered it in last class right so humayu with hamida banu begum got shelter in the amar court only uh, where akbar was born so it was a story which was uh, a, a part of medieval history but right now you are in the modern history right just understand that here akbar is not here anymore okay uh, basically just uh, understand that amar court is in the capture of these uh, talpura amirs and raja of jodhpur you know was there who have the rule in amar court then these uh, uh, lord of sindh these amir ye sindh ke jo amir hain wo amar court se fir karachi chale gaye they got karachi from the chief uh, lewis and then they got uh, shekarpur and bukkar from the afghan so they started expanding more and more theek hai so shekarpur bhi jeet liya bukkar bhi jeet liya jodhpur amar court sab kuch jeet liya now they are having a good empire what happened was that uh, eic english east india company was seeing this expansion of charyars and this power so they decided not to interfere 
but when they understood that these people are very stable and uh, uh, we can have a good policy of friendship with them they decided to have a peace and uh, they sent a friend request like okay send amirs we want a friendship with you guys that we want to have a trading facility in your area so let's come and stay together and you know let us do the trade and make some profit in the area of sindh so that's why lord auckland uh, at that time uh, he you know started his own policy so lord auckland became the governor general of india in 1836 when he was the governor general he looked at sindh from a very important perspective he knew that if he wants to save india from any possible russian invasion or any foreign attack it's important to control sindh because sindh is like the gate of india right ye gate hai india ka to kisi ko bhi agar bharat aana hai to wo yahi se aayega isliye isko control karna zaruri hai so that's why they decided that we should have some in, sub you know influence in this area so that's why uh, they wanted to stop the russian invasion because at that time there was a possible russian invasion in their mind and also to influence afghans because afghans are neighbors right to influence afghans also and to have some control in that area uh, auckland wanted to have some peace in the sindh area so they got this opportunity when ranjit singh captured the frontier town of sindh okay he captured a very important town of sindh which was rojhan and fortinger ओके सो पोटिंगर वॉज सेंट टू हैदराबाद हैदराबाद मतलब ये वो वाला हैदराबाद नहीं है जो इंडिया में है ये वो वाला है जो अभी पाकिस्तान में है ठीक है नॉर्थ वेस्टर्न साइड में एक और हैदराबाद है तो वहाँ पे भेजा था और वहाँ पे जो है पोटिंगर गए और उन्होंने एक नई ट्रीटी अमीर के साथ साइन की अमीर मतलब सिंध के अमीर के साथ वाई लेट्स अंडरस्टैंड दिस प्रॉब्लम है रंजीत सिंह इज वेरी वेरी पावरफुल ओके एट दैट टाइम रंजीत सिंह वॉज राइजिंग एंड एक्सपैंडिंग सो ई English East India Company knew that Ranjit Singh is very furious leader, and Ranjit Singh किसी के सुनते नहीं थे. So Ranjit Singh was very powerful. Now they understood that if Amirs want to save their territory, they can only take help from EIC. Otherwise, Ranjit Singh will destroy Sindh. Ranjit Singh will capture the entire part of Sindh very soon. So if Sindh wants any protection from Ranjit Singh, then Sindh should come under the control of eic okay so company helped the sindh amirs that we will help you with our troops we will send your troops and uh, we can you know help you in defeating ranjit singh or having protection from ranjit singh so it was an opportunity to eic to offer this uh, you know uh, offer this friendship when ranjit singh captured the uh, important frontier town of sindh which was rojhan now company troops would be kept in the capital at the amir's expense which is a subsidiary alliance again i hope you understand alternatively english would be given a suitable concession in return a money a amount of uh, a good sum uh, a good amount was given to the eic so now sindh became british protectorate so sindh was turned into a british protectorate in 1838 so if i ask you simply that why sindh became a british protectorate because they were afraid of ranjit singh because of the expansion of ranjit singh ranjit singh was expanding and that's why eic took this opportunity lord auckland followed this policy and he wanted this policy why because if you look at this map sindh जो है भारत का दरवाजा है यहाँ से अगर किसी को भी आना है भारत के अंदर तो वो पहले सिंध से आएगा और उससे भी पहले अफगानिस्तान से आएगा काबुल से आएगा तो अफगानिस्तान वॉज इम्पॉर्टेंट एंड ऑलरेडी अफगानिस्तान में दुरानी एम्पायर था राइट right? यहाँ पे बहुत इंपॉर्टेंट रूलर थे दोस्त मोहम्मद सो वी विल सी एंग्लो अफगान वॉर सो आफ्टर गेटिंग सिंध इन द कंट्रोल नेक्स्ट टारगेट इज अफगानिस्तान ओके next is anglo afghan wars so we will see anglo afghan wars why because sindh to already protectorate ban gaya hai english ka so eic is now already protecting sindh so they will now take care of afghanistan also that afghanistan the boundaries of afghanistan are also in the eic control so that no attack from russia or any other country could happen in india because if anyone comes to india they can come from this area only right but they won't be able to come from this area anymore because already afghanistan sind and everything would be under the control of eic that's why eic started anglo afghan wars 
got it the reason behind the anglo afghan wars clear okay that's fine now i can see you guys that you guys are not asking me any questions why i hope you are enjoying the topic right it's a very interesting topic it's a very interesting part and uh, now we can discuss about afghan and we can discuss something about ranjit singh in the punjab okay very important story very uh, you know uh, i just love this story of uh, raja ranjit singh and uh, you would be very amazed with this story of bravery that how ranjit singh you know uh, got this entire area one more important point aap sabhi ko students ko ek issue rehta hoga ki kashmir ka dispute samajh mein nahi aata hai kai bar ki kashmir ka dispute kya hai we all get confused sometimes we don't understand that why india and pakistan have this dispute and why the problem of Kas kashmir is not getting resolved okay so if you want to understand the problem of kashmir just watch this particular session live for 10 minutes okay just understand because in 10 minutes i'll tell you the background of the kashmir problem that how kashmir came under the control of ranjit singh then after the death of ranjit singh it was sold to gulam singh and then after it was sold how it got under the problem during the uh, independence of india and how pakistan got involved theek hai wo story abhi main aapko samjhaungi within 5 to 10 minutes just wait for it because ranjit singh only started the history of kashmir okay i'll just tell you so let's resume as we need to discuss the anglo afghan wars and uh, some you know things related to kashmir we will start with the background of ranjit singh so it starts with the shukra chakia misl what do you mean by a misl misl is like a group okay it's like a group so uh, at the time of the birth of ranjit singh it was the birthday of 2nd november 1780 uh, there used to be 12 important misls okay misl are the sikh groups okay so like alu waliya misl bhangi dale waliya faizalpuria kadhaiya karod sanghiya nakia nishaniya uh, fulakia ramgadhiya shukra chakia shaheed misl ye sare alag alag misl the so mahan singh uh, you know was the father of ranjit singh he was the leader from shukra chakia misl but mahan singh died when ranjit singh was only 12 years old after the death of mahan singh ranjit singh started controlling this misl and uh, uh, you know having uh, understood the political uh, problems and reasons in this area and uh, you know he knew that how the problem is going on in the afghanistan also so he was expanding so basically at that time Afghanistan was in the civil war okay it was engulfed in a civil war and due to a power struggle which was there in the Afghanistan which went for uh, the next uh, three decades so basically for 30 years in Afghanistan civil war or uh, succession ki problem chal rahi thi there was a struggle going on in Afghanistan so a lot of issue was going on ranjit singh took this opportunity to expand his rule and he knew that there is no other important power to you know uh, stop him so these events in the neighboring regions and these neighboring regions which are disturbed neighboring regions uh, you know uh, these events were fully exploited by ranjit singh because he used to follow a very ruthless policy of blood and iron if you remember that policy of doctrine of lapse which was given by dalhousie so basically that doctrine of lapse was the idea which was followed by ranjit singh also that if there is a area in which there is no successor then that area could be taken over by the uh, government the sikh empire 
so he was very ruthless and he used to follow this blood and iron policy and by following this policy he carved out for himself a kingdom in the central punjab and this sikh empire uh, became a very strong and very powerful empire so in 1799 ranjit singh okay was appointed as the governor of lahore by zaman shah okay zaman shah was the ruler of afghanistan he wanted ranjit singh to control the lahore so now ranjit singh you know he was the governor of lahore so he uh, was taking care of the capital and in 1805 ranjit singh in 1805 remember the date 1805 ranjit singh acquired jammu and amritsar okay jammu and amritsar so now he made the lahore political capital and religious capital amritsar so amritsar was the religious capital of punjab and lahore was the political capital of punjab it came under the rule of ranjit singh and he maintained very good relations with dogras dogras of jammu okay jammu mein dogri bhasha dogri dance bhi hota hai dogri language boli jati hai so dogras were uh, was from jammu okay and nepalis also because uh, nepali area wahan border pe aata hai so from uh, you know uh, uh, nepalis also with dogras also he used to maintain good relations and he used to uh you know enlist them in his army also so that these people from the neighboring areas are ranjit singh's friend now the problem was that uh, english east india company wanted to have some friendship with ranjit singh and they sent friend request also but ranjit singh was not accepting ranjit singh was like no i can you know take care of my things by myself i don't want any help from eic and i'll control my areas and regions as per my wish and wills so the prospects of a joint franco russian invasion france with russia could invade india this problem you know this kind of doubt was there in the minds of eic and it could happen through the land route which alarmed english and that's why in 1807 Lord Minto sent Charles Metcalf to Lahore. Lahore is the political capital of Punjab, where Ranjit Singh was ruling. Now Ranjit Singh offered to accept the Metcalf's proposal of an offensive and defensive alliance. अतः एक दोस्ती करने की बात हुई कि let's do a friendship on the condition that English would remain neutral in case of Sikh-Afghan war. Means in case Ranjit Singh goes in the uh, area of afghanistan then english east india company won't come in between they will not help afghanis and ranjit singh can expand the empire okay and eic will consider ranjit singh the sovereign ruler of entire punjab including the malwa okay malwa means the areas around satluj river so a big area could be under the control of ranjit singh undisputedly and eic will recognize it however these negotiations failed ranjit singh was like no i don't want to have a friendship right now but later on there was a changed political scenario because there was a napoleonic danger napoleonic danger like uh, by that time napoleon became very powerful in europe okay and he became the emperor so napoleon wanted to invade india also so this uh, uh, you know issue was there in the minds of the english and some indian rulers so there was a possible napoleonic invasion in india so english became more assertive now ranjit singh started uh, you know discussion with eic and they agreed to sign a treaty this was the treaty of amritsar treaty of amritsar was signed on 25th april 1809 okay with the eic now according to this treaty of amritsar satluj river was considered as the boundary okay like uh, if this is the satluj river the eastern part of india would be under the eic and the western part would be under the ranjit singh so satluj river became the boundary according to this treaty of amritsar okay it extended his rule over entire sikh nation by accepting the satluj river as the boundary line for his dominion and the company's dominion now with this treaty of amritsar the boundary was decided so it was decided that ranjit singh if this is the satluj river he will never cross satluj river okay he could not go to this area 
Why? Because the eastern side of Satluj River was under the EIC control, English East India Company's control. So, what will Ranjit Singh do? He will only try to expand westward. He will just spread his dimensions in the western direction because he could not go in the eastern direction. So, he directed his energies toward the west. So, he captured Multan in 1818, very important. He captured Kashmir in 1819. He captured Peshawar in 1834. So, Multan, Kashmir, Peshawar, these areas were controlled by Ranjit Singh. Here, understand the story of Kashmir starts. Okay, very easy date to remember 1819, 18 19, right? Easy to remember. So, Kashmir was captured by Ranjit Singh in 1819. Remember this. Now, what will happen in Kashmir? We will understand after the death of Ranjit Singh. In June 1838, Ranjit Singh was compelled by a political compel, uh, compulsion to sign a tripartite treaty. Okay, unwillingly he had to sign a treaty in June 1838. Okay, what was the tripartite treaty? It was a treaty with three people, English, okay, and an ambitious ruler of Afghanistan who wanted to rule Afghanistan. Okay. He was there, Shah Suja, who was against Dost Muhammad. Dost Muhammad was the ruler of Afghanistan. So, English, Ranjit Singh and Shuja, these three people together signed the two his territories because uh, already Satluj River was the boundary. So, he said that you won't cross my area. You will not use my soil to attack Dost Muhammad, who was the Afghanistan Samir, who was the uh, ruler of Afghanistan. Dost Muhammad was a very popular ruler of Afghanistan. English wanted to replace Dost Muhammad. Why? Because Dost Muhammad was not giving English powers in Afghanistan and was a, in a good friendship with Russia. So, a possible uh, Russian invasion was there in the mind of Britishers and that's why they wanted to replace Dost Muhammad. After this treaty and everything, you will see Ranjit Singh will rule for a few years, but at a very young age, he will die. He died in June 1839. Okay. June 1839, he died. Matlab, baad, after signing this triple tight treaty, after one year, he died. After his death, the process of decline of Sikh empire started. If you remember, he got the area of Kashmir in 1890. He signed the uh, triple treaty, the treaty. But you will see that after the death of Ranjit Singh, Anglo-Sikh war will start. In the first Anglo-Sikh war, a heavy level of war indemnity was imposed on Sikhs because Sikhs got defeated and they were not able to pay so. Uh, around 75 lakh rupees uh, was not there with them and that's why they sold Kashmir to uh, Gulam, uh, you know, uh, Gulab Singh and Gulab Singh became the ruler of Kashmir after the Anglo-Sikh wars, which we will discuss. There is one more thing I want to, um, you know, make you understand here. Just understand what is the policy of ring and fence. Policy of ring and fence is hero or maro. Means if you want to attack someone, you can, you know, attack that person by safeguarding, uh, you know, their own territories and by, you know, taking care of the neighboring areas. So, this policy was by Warren Hasting. And it was reflected in Marathas and Mesur wars. So, if you remember, they were not attacking two areas simultaneously, right? They used to take care of one area and then they used to come to the other area. If you remember, the chief dangers to company's territory was from Afghan invaders and Marathas. So, they initiated it step by step. They safeguard against these dangers. The company undertook to organize a defense of the frontiers of Awadh also. And the condition that Nawab would defray the expenses of defending army. Means if the defending army of EIC is there, then expense would be on the Indian ruler or the Indian Nawab. Okay, this kind of policy of ring and fence was there. In Abad also this policy was there. In Bengal also the same system was there. To, you know, uh, they used to promise that we will help you against the external aggression. But you just need to pay the army. On the other words, these allies were required to maintain a subsidiary force. So it's like a you know equipped force commanded by the officer of the company, but would be paid by the Indian ruler. So this policy of Wellesley 
helped him making the subsidiary alliance, imposed subsidiary alliance by extending the ring and fence system. And then he got so many Indian states under his control, under his dominion. Okay, so that's why the subsidiary alliance, which is very, very important. And here you need to understand that they will impose subsidiary alliance on Sikhs also. After the death of Ranjit Singh in the Anglo-Sikh war, we will see that it will end with subsidiary alliance. If you can just, you know, uh, recall things in Mysore, in Maratha, in everywhere, in all the wars, at the end they used to impose subsidiary alliance. Like they used to end the things with subsidiary alliance. So it was the strategy. Okay, so it was a system by Lord Wellesley from 1798 to 1805 who ruled, uh, you know, in India and he wanted to make a big empire in this system. He wanted to have a permanently stationed British force and it used to pay a subsidy for its maintenance with the Indian expense. Okay, so the Indian ruler had to agree posting a British resident in his court who will spy on the Indian ruler. Okay, so Indian ruler could not employ any other European in the service without the permission of Britishers. Nor could he negotiate with any other Indian ruler without consulting the Governor General. So Britishers would defend the ruler from his enemies and adopt a policy of non-interference in the internal matters of the allied state. So these kind of things were there in the subsidiary alliance. There were many stages, four stages were there. In the first stage, company used to offer a friendly help, a friendly gesture. In the second stage, they had to make a field to create a base for their own soldiers. Okay, so they used to make a common cause with the Indian state to make some, you know, friendly things. In the third stage, uh, when the Indian ally was asked not for the men but for money, the company promised that it would recruit, train, and maintain a fixed number of soldiers under the British forces, and that contingent would be available to the ruler for his personal and family's protection uh, at also for keeping out aggression uh, with a fixed sum of money and at the fourth stage money or the protection fee was fixed usually at a very high level at a very high price so this was the way company used to enter into the internal matters of indian states indian territories Many territories accepted subsidiary alliance and there was a question in PYQ. So the Nizam of Hyderabad, September 1798 and 1800. The ruler of Mysore in 1799 after killing Tipu Sultan. The ruler of Tanjore in October 1798. Nawab of Awadh, okay, in 1801. Peshwa in 1801. Bhosle, Raja of Birar in 1803. Sindhya in 1804. Rajput states of Jaipur, uh, Jodhpur, Macheri, Bundi, ruler of Bharatpur in 1818. Holkars were the last Marathas confederation to accept the subsidiary alliance in 1818. Okay, Holkars were from Indore, right? So you can see how things were there. So just understand Bombay, Delhi, Kolapur, Deccan, Madras, Odisha, Punjab state, Sikkim, all these states were there. Okay, now. Uh, one more thing was there which was known as the doctrine of lapse, okay, where if the uh, father's property needs to be inherited, so there was a problem that if father is not having a biological son, then the property will lapse and will go under the British dominion. So, in simple terms, doctrine stated the adopted son, okay, doctrine means the adopted son who will have no powers, okay, however, adopted son could be the higher to his foster father's private property but not the state means he will not become the ruler right it was for a paramount power of the britishers where they decided whether to bestow the state on the adopted son or to annex it the doctrine was stated to be the based on the hindu law and indian customs but hindu law seemed to be somewhat inclusive on this point okay because where many Indian sovereign annex the states on his vassalage on account of lapse, like I told you about Raja Ranjit Singh, he also used to follow this policy, so that there is no issue of uh, you know hires or you know having any kind of cause later in future in which a dispute could could be there. So to start this paramount power, Lord Dalhousie started this new doctrine of lapse, and in Satara in 1848 they got this idea of doctrine of lapse and 
you know took control of it jaitpur bundelkhand sambalpur in odisha bhagat in madhya pradesh all these areas even lord dalhousie uh, annexed avadh in 1856 after deposing nawab wajid ali shah on the grounds of misgovernance so dalhousie annexed eight states during the eight year tenure from 1848 to 56 by doctrine of laps as a governor general so this is also which you need to remember like it's a very short point but this is also important okay now uh we need to discuss what we need to discuss anglo sikh wars anglo afghan wars anglo bhutan nepal and few other neighboring uh, wars which were there in the neighboring states of india but i think today we have completed a lot and uh, we can end the session now because it is already a very long session so from here i'll continue the story tomorrow and uh, uh, we will have the class from monday to friday so you need to be on time from monday to friday so we will continue the story uh, after the death of ranjit singh because ranjit singh died in june 1839 so i will continue the story of sikh empire after the death of ranjit singh that what will happen after his death that we will discuss and we will continue it uh, from here uh, what will be there in the sikh area and how the anglo sikh wars are going to be there so anglo sikh wars anglo afghan war anglo nepal anglo bhutan uh, uh anglo bhutan wars would be covered tomorrow anglo burma war also so we will discuss all of these wars uh, with uh, you know conclusions and uh, things like how britishers ultimately expanded their empire right so we don't have much time right now so we'll just end the session here thank you so much for coming guys thank you so much for watching i hope you like the video i hope you you are liking and loving the explanation and you are able to cover the spectrum uh, now very nicely but still in case you have any doubts you can always ask me in the comment section see you guys then take care bye bye have a great day and uh, uh, there is a question yes you guys can ask your question don't worry i'll just take uh, one by one uh, virish yogander you have asked one question about how singh died and then one question is by abhishek kumar am tipu did not sign subsidiary alliance na it was his successor a uh, c i told you that tipu sultan died right tipu sultan died and if you remember the story if you if you can watch the a uh, story of uh, mysore you will understand the uh, you know entire scenario that the wodeya dynasty came again by the eic because they uh, you know uh, understood that the minor son of wodeya dynasty can only rule so they decided to uh, have that particular uh, you know uh, infant again not infant but that small young boy on the throne and uh, they signed subsidiary alliance with them okay just remember that part now coming to other questions uh, there was one more question that how ranjit singh died in 1839 remember that he never died in any war he well, he just fell ill okay and that's why he died in lahore it was not because of any war against anyone he never died in a battle he just fell ill by himself and died and after him his all his sons died uh, unfortunately one by one uh, sometimes it is said that they were poisoned or they they were very ill they were very uh, you know unwell and because of ill health they got died and uh, there is a, a huge level of controversy on the death of ranjit singh and the deaths after Uh, you know the death of ranjit singh like the way uh, all his uh, uh, sons got died and the way things happened in this uh, sikh empire we will discuss it don't worry it is going to be there in the next class but understand that ranjit singh never got died in the battlefield he 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 was not uh, he was not losing any battle he didn't uh, lose anything he didn't lose his life in any battle ground against anyone he died due to his own ill health in lahore okay due to his his own ill health in lahore because he was not fine he was not well okay so we will just continue from here and i just need to cover few points related to uh, neighboring countries so i'll just continue the discussion from here right 
एनी अदर डाउट गाइज लेट मी नो ओके फाइन थैंक यू सो मच गाइज थैंक यू सो मच फॉर वॉचिंग यू देन टेक केयर बाय बाय हैव अ ग्रेट डे